Today I speak with Dr. Terry Walls. She is a clinical professor at the University of Iowa School of Medicine and a prolific researcher in multiple sclerosis, a condition she had herself, and as you'll hear during her story, was able to get herself out of a wheelchair with an approach that is centered in dietary and lifestyle practices. One of the things that I really appreciate about Terry, again, is the fact that she publishes so much research, as well as the fact that she has been there herself. This conversation isn't limited to utility for only those with MS multiple sclerosis because the concepts of the diet and lifestyle recommendations that she espouses have applicability for brain health across the board, partially via favorably manipulating or modulating microglial and astrocytic cells, as you'll learn about in the body of the episode. So if you or someone you love has MS or you care about general healthy principles for diet and lifestyle to improve but not limited to your brain health, then I think this episode will be really insightful. Uh, Terry, again, thank you for the work that you do and the great conversation. And now we will go to the show. Hey, Terry, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great having you. It's always so nice speaking with you. You know, as someone who is a aspiring researcher early in my career, I look at the mm-hmm. work you're doing, what you've published, what you've built with a lot of respect and admiration. So it really is always a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, thank you so much. And especially in the realm of what you're doing specifically, it seems so much of research drifts and continues to go in this direction of reductionistic drug model research, this sort of ethos we find ourselves in, the fact that you're doing these trials that look at diet and lifestyle measures and how they can impact a serious illness like MS is just so great. So again, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah, you know, it's really been a challenge. Um, You know, when I first started doing uh, research clinical trials, uh, some of my mentors uh, really wanted me to do that reductionistic uh, model pick Right. one compound, one molecule, one pathway. Right. And fortunately for me, uh, the chair of medicine at the time, uh, Paul Rothman, uh, understood uh, that what I was doing uh, required this multimodal approach. Uh, right. And so he helped me uh, stand my ground, say, no, 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 we're going to see first, can other people implement this very complicated regimen that I implemented uh, and uh, how safe it is? So that first study showed that, yeah, people could implement uh, my very complicated regimen and that when they did, uh, if you're overweight, they lost weight without being hungry and that um, fatigue went down, quality of life went up, anxiety went down, depression went down, right. and half of the people with, you know, this is primary, secondary progressive MS where you expect a 15% worsening of their walking every year. Half Mm -hmm. of them had clinically meaningful improvement in walking. Um, So that was uh, really quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's again, it's just amazing. And and it's good uh, evidence to support that if we intervene upstream, many things downstream will improve all at the same time, right? Uh, And and so uh, before we nerd out further, which I definitely want to do, Let's go over your kind of your backstory in case people haven't heard you uh, or sure. of you. You've been on the podcast before, but for new people to our audience, what's the backstory? Yeah. So, you know, I, I grew up on a farm northeast of Iowa, um, uh, physically very, very active. Um, I was an artist, um, uh, oil painting. I did some metallurgy. So that meant soldering uh, with lead. I uh, entered medical school. Thrilled to be getting to dissect cadavers. So I uh, go unwrap cadavers, do more drawings, and probably have three times the formaldehyde dose that my cohort has. <laughs> right. And then my face pain started. Uh, jolts of electrical pain starting here at my temple coming down to my jaw. Uh, they become more frequent, more severe, much more difficult to turn off. I have an episode of dim vision uh, eight years later. Um, get big workup. It's still not clear uh, what's going on. I'm told to reduce my um, uh, training because if I race, 
I, I, I have dim vision in my left eye. Uh, and if I take a hot uh, sauna or a hot tub, I have dim vision in my left eye. Hmm. Um, so I must have been really disconcerting. That's well, I would you know, that's a scary it, symptom to have. Um, and so I backed off on my racing, stopped taking saunas and hot tub, and you know, thought about coming actually to the University of Iowa because they had uh, 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 the nation's best uh, eye service at that time. But yeah, but life was busy. And then I had a couple of kids. Life got busier still. And then in 2000, um, I'm out, wa uh, out walking and my left leg becomes weak. Now dragging it, I hobble home. See, see the neurologist, um, Andy, uh, tells, tells me this could be bad or really, really bad. Uh, and then we, we begin the workup. It takes about three weeks. And while I'm waiting for the workup, you know, I'm thinking about the 20 years of worsening face pains that I've had. And so I'm praying secretly for a fatal diagnosis. You know, I, I finally hear the words multiple sclerosis. I see the very best MS centers in the country. I take the newest drugs. And three years later, I hear tilt recline wheelchair. Now my face pains are um, getting relatively worse. My 10 year old daughter, Zeb, hugs me as tears stream down my face. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm asking myself, am I really doing all that I can? Um, so I go back to reading the basic science. I go to PubMed. I'm reading night after night. I decide that mitochondria are the drivers of disability, and I create a supplement cocktail to support my mitochondria. And the speed of my decline slows, uh, and I'm really grateful. Then I discover a study using uh, electrical. Sorry, Terry, one, one question. Where are you relative to your medical training now? Are you uh, so uh, I'm um, are you through the the hells of so, residency? So I'm I'm through residency. I've been in practice, uh, medical practice, uh, for about uh, 20 years. Okay. So, so I have a lot of clinical experience. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a, a professor here at the University of Iowa by then. Uh, I, I've been uh, doing the paleo diet uh, for several years. Uh, you know, I decide that mitochondria are the drivers. I uh, add in these supplements. It slows my decline. You know, and I'm super grateful, but I, you know, I am still declining. Then I discover a study using electrical stimulation of muscles in people who've been paralyzed. Mm. Uh, and I asked my physical therapist, you know, could I try that? He calls it e-stim. He says it's for athletes. He says it's painful, and he knows I have a lot of neuropathic pain from the MS. Right. But he gives me a test session. It hurts bad, really, really bad. But when it's over, I feel great. It's the best I have felt in years. He mm. says it's the endorphins. Mm. Uh, and we add e-stim to my physical therapy. Um, and then I have um, a new aha. And, and now I'm actually sort of embarrassed that it took me this long to have this aha. <laughs> because, because it's like, you know, Hindsight, what if right? I... Yeah. What if I take this list of nutrients that I'm taking in supplement form and figure out where they are in the food supply? I bet it, I get other stuff that's really important and helpful. And so I, I do that. And I have, you know, a list of foods that I should be eating. And I have this new way of eating that I start at uh, December 26, 2007. And for context, at that point, I begin to have brain fog. Uh, my fatigue is quite severe. I cannot sit up anymore. I have mm. a special chair, zero gravity chair with my knees higher than my nose. I staff the resident clinic from that zero gravity chair. I uh, take my meals with my family from that zero gravity chair. And I, I walk, I'm walking very short distances in my house with two walking sticks. And we are uh, talking about what it would take to remodel my home to accommodate my scooter inside the house uh, because it's so difficult uh, walking. That's where I'm at December 26th. Now, I've been doing e-stim. I can do 10 minutes of exercise. Uh, if I do more than 10 minutes, I, uh, I just can't function. And at the end of January, my fatigue is markedly reduced. My mental clarity is much better. And my physical therapist says, Terry, you're definitely stronger. I'm advancing your exercises. And I want you to exercise twice a day. 
Yay. <laughs> okay, so well, I go to uh, 15 minutes, then 15 minutes twice a day, then 20 minutes twice a day, then 30 minutes twice a day. And by the end of February, I'm beginning to, to walk with walking sticks at the VA hospital. And in Mother's Day, so really um, uh, five minutes, uh, five months of this new diet, this highly structured paleo diet, um, I tell my family I want to try riding my bike. We have an emergency family meeting. Uh, Jackie uh, decides that, that we can try. She'll tell my big, tall, six foot five. I was going to say someone big Zach. needs to be there to catch you, right? Right. So he's going to jog alongside on the left. My daughter Zeb, who's thirteen, she'll jog alongside on the right, and she'll follow. And good so for you, get, by the way, for for having that desire just to, so to I, push yeah. and go. Um, and so we all get in position. Uh, there's no cars coming. Jack says, "Okay, push off." So I push off. Bike wobbles just a little bit. But I catch my balance and I bike around the block. Now that big 16-year-old boy, he's crying. Hmm. My 13-year-old daughter, she's crying. Jackie's crying. I mean, I bet going from a wheelchair to that, for them to see and, and see mom is mom is no longer going in this direction that scares us. She's reclaiming her power. It must have been just tear jerking for everybody. You know, and I still cry uh, yeah. talking about that moment. And so I start biking a little more every day. And then in October, Jackie says, let's sign you up for the Courage Ride. It's 18.5 miles. You know, however far you <laughs> go, it. it'll be great. And now at that point, eight miles was the farthest I'd gone. So I had to have several breaks, but I made it. And so once again, when I crossed the finish line, my kids are crying, Jackie's crying, I'm crying. And that fundamentally changes how I think about disease and health. It will change the way I practice medicine, and it will change the focus uh, of the research that I do. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, gosh, so much there to respond to and to unpack. But I, I think maybe the root concept is when you have a health challenge, it, it changes the way that you think about health. And as much as the reductionistic study has its time and its place, I think it misses this broader element of psychology, motivation, lifestyle, all these things really tie together to lead to, I would argue, as you were such a, a beautiful example of, much better outcomes. Because a, a lot of that was your psyche driving you to move. And I'm assuming that if you sort of stayed in this box of, well, I'm going to play it safe and stay with the walker or stay with the cane, and there wasn't this desire to push yourself or perhaps your clinician could help impart in you an empowered perspective. Uh, that's the element that I think is much harder to study in a reductionistic setting, although you seem to be doing it with your research, hence why I'm so happy about the work <laughs> that you're doing. You know, um, you cannot create health without addressing the whole network. Right. Um, the the uh, molecule by molecule studies can help us understand uh, biochemistry can help us understand physiology, but you know life uh, happens because of this, that self-correcting biochemistry and this very rich network that has all of these uh, repeating cycles of chemistry that let everything stay within a range. Right. Therefore, um, as our health deteriorates, the more we can support the network of biochemistry through mm -hmm. multiple. Uh, uh, supports, the, the more likely we are to restore that optimal network of biochemistry and the more likely we are to restore health. You'll never be able to do it with one molecular pathway because of all those counterbalancing mechanisms. Right. You have to address the whole network, or at least as much of the network as you can. Right, right. And this is one of the reasons why while we will, on the podcast, discuss mechanism, we always juxtapose that with Show me the outcome data, because when you make a successful outcome, you may manipulate twenty mechanisms, and well, absolutely, or, or 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 more, and maybe some of those mechanisms move in the wrong direction or a bad direction. But if the net outcome is a favorable impact on the host, that's really what we need to be looking at. And this happens so often with just to throw out one common example. Sorry for our podcast audience mm -hmm. if this is trite, but someone will have had a candida antibody positive three years ago. 
And now they're walking around thinking they, they have candida and therefore they're avoiding all carbs. And when you look at them, it's clear they are malnourished from a carb perspective. They're underweight, they're not sleeping well, they're irritable. And you ask them, well, how do you feel when you eat rice or you eat fruit? And they oftentimes will reply, I feel good, but I have candida, therefore I avoid it. And that's a good example of where uh, a mechanism, let's say there, there might be an antibody response to candida mm -hmm. in the gut is leading someone to totally discount that maybe that's normal for you and candida antibodies are not very diagnostically accurate in, in the setting of, of GI care. And so we have to be careful with how much we change behaviors based upon one mechanism. As I know well, you know, but just to put that out there. Yeah, and I want people um, to uh, be curious, uh, to have um, view your interventions as an experiment. You are the principal investigator of your life. So you can try, you can test my hypothesis that, well, maybe a low, I feel better on a low carb diet. Maybe I feel better on a moderate carb diet. Uh, and so you could have an experiment, an intervention. Uh, you, you decide it's, I'll moderately increase my carbs. I'll do it for time period, pick a week, a month, right. and I'll reassess my symptoms. I'll ask my family to reassess my symptoms at the end of the intervention period and then decide. You're right. I feel worse on a moderate carb diet. Oh, I feel better on a moderate carb diet. It's an okay intervention. Yes. That That is the way that, that all of us could fine tune um, our self-care routines. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's so well said. And maybe how I would tie that together for people is, okay, as you said, Terry, be curious, look at your lab markers, but use that to inform a hypothesis and run a test. Don't just assume mm -hmm. because you have this one lab finding, you are doing this one thing forever, right? If you're going to be a scientist, be a true scientist and say, okay, can you get an antibody? Maybe that means I need to be on low or uh, keto type of carb intake, let me run the test. And then if that is the right thing, I will feel better. And if it's not the right thing, then it's back to the hypothesis drawing board for another experiment to trial. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. And, and the intervention that you're doing, you might discover that I need to do this intervention for six months uh, or a year or two years. Uh, and it may or may not have to be the rest of my life. Yeah, well said. Well, let's pivot over to some of your research. I have a number of notes here that I've taken on, well, everything that you've been doing, right? But um, to kick off the um, diet that's ongoing with the University of Iowa, now I see why the Iowa affili affiliation from your, your backstory. Tell us a little bit about this study because it's, it's really interesting in that you're looking at a few different types of diet and- sure. Sure. Um, I, I really love the fact that you're not just trying to, let's say, pit one dietary extreme against another. And you see this in research sometimes. You have yeah, someone yeah. who's kind of a, a, a vegetarian researcher and you look at the design and you say to yourself, eh, well, this study almost is for certain to set up the vegetarian diet to look better. When I look at your setup, it looks like a true and honest interrogation of a few different diets to – uh, yeah, discover so, whatever you're, right. you're finding. So we, we have three diets. Uh, we have the modified paleo diet, uh, which people will know is basically the Walls Elimination Diet. We have a time-restricted olive oil ketogenic diet, and we have uh, the person's usual diet. Uh, we'll follow uh, it, and we, um, the time-restricted olive oil ketogenic diet is more heart-friendly than most ketogenic diets because uh, we stress olive oil as opposed to uh, butter, ghee, uh, eggs, uh, saturated fats uh, that are found in dairy. Uh, and then we time-restrict. We have people have a six to eight hour eating window. Uh, that makes it easier to be in ketosis with a slightly lower uh, um, fat intake of 70 to 80 percent fat. Right. The usual diet is whatever you're uh, eating presently. Uh, people come to Iowa uh, at month zero, month three, and month 24 will get measures of walking hand, vision, uh, uh, working memory, uh, and will measure quality of life, uh, mood, uh, anxiety, depression scores, and fatigue scores. Mm. And we are measuring uh, brain volume 
at baseline using a research MRI, so no contrast, and we're repeating the MRI at the end of the study at 24 months. And the question, one of the questions we're asking is, can I get, because people with MS, it's a little disturbing because I have MS, our, on average, our brains are shrinking uh, by 1% or more each year, which mm-hmm. is why people with MS have higher rates of frailty, higher rates of cognitive decline and dementia than the general public. Mm-hmm. My hypothesis, based on, on my experience and what I see in my clinic, is that as, people, as we fix people's diets, the brain volume and uh, their cognitive performance remarkably improves. Right. So we're going to test by teaching people how to fix their diet, can we get them back to healthy rates of aging, of brain aging? And uh, we think the answer to that question is yes. We, With- we don't know, but we'll find out. Right, right. Now, this phenomenal design, and I'm super curious to see what the results are. Um, so a few follow-up questions I have in looking at this uh, and, and listening to you. The elimination diet for the, the paleo elimination, is that eliminating standard paleo foods, or is there some sort of personalization well, yeah. people go through? So uh, people uh, will come in, we'll get them on the paleo diet, get them comfortable with that for the first three months. Then in the second three months, we take out all grains, all legumes, um, uh, all nightshades, so eggplants, peppers, uh, tomatoes, uh, potatoes, and then uh, so th- then after that, when they come back, we'll let them reintroduce the nightshades one group at a time, uh, right. so we can identify do they have intolerances or not, and, and we find that some folks. Uh, are able to bring everything back in. We'll also let them try to reintroduce eggs, uh, first with the egg yolks and then the egg whites, because if you tolerate eggs, they are a a really super food. But if you're like me and you don't tolerate eggs, they Uh, will kick up your immune system and you'll be quite miserable. Sure. Well, I also really like the progressive nature of the elimination. I think what happens all too often is people go on a elimination diet And then they assume, well, I feel better, therefore eliminate all these things in perpetuity. So I like how you start with kind of this soft paleo and people are likely going to improve. And then you do further elimination to see if there's further improvement so people don't conflate that, hey, I went right to AIP, therefore I have to avoid everything on the autoimmune food list. Yeah, and and I I stress to people that my goal is to have the least restrictive diet long term. Uh, and, and so uh, we we use this. Now, in my clinical practice, um, but then I present to the patients that we can do the elimination diet or we can do food sensitivity testing uh, right. to guide this. But in the food sensitivity testing, uh, it just costs more money. Uh, when I first started doing this, I was at the VA, and food sensitivity testing was, was not possible. So we had to do the elimination diet to sort, sort this out for everyone. And as a follow-up question on this, something that admittedly frustrates me is when people have an autoimmune condition and therefore they assume every autoimmune condition requires the autoimmune paleo diet. In my experience, nothing could be further from the truth. It, mm-hmm. It's way more than most people need. And in fact, I would argue it's probably detrimental because it's so restrictive and people will be on that long term. You're probably one of the most qualified people to answer this yeah. given this study setup. What are you seeing? Well, I'd say you know the vast majority, um, probably eighty percent, will do perfectly fine. Uh, what I call my walls level one: take out gluten, dairy, and eggs, uh, and then after three to six months, you can see if you can get eggs back in, uh, and you'll probably just do fine with that. And that lets people who are vegetarian uh, follow, or vegans follow the diet quite successfully, or meat eaters. Uh, and then, if you if you're ready to be a little more um, comprehensive, uh, we can do. Uh, the walls paleo, which adds the fermented foods, stresses the organ meats, uh, and you know further restricts the amount of carbs. Uh, and then the elimination diet, which I uh, already just described: no grains, no legumes, uh, and no nightshades. And then we reintroduce things, ingredients one back at a time to sort out: okay, what what do you tolerate? Uh, what do you not tolerate? And then I further personalize based on your glucose and insulin levels. Mm. Uh, Do I have to put you on a lower carb diet because you're developing metabolic syndrome? Uh, Because we we know people with 
autoimmune disease have higher rates of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome than the general public. Uh, and so many of us uh, are developing insulin resistance. There are no symptoms that you can feel physically. And unless you uh, know to be screening for it uh, and monitoring your glucose, uh, monitoring your A1C, monitoring your insulin levels, you would never know. And what do you think drives that? Is that inflammation? Uh, I could see two prominent hypotheses offered here. One would be inflammation and that skewing metabolism. The other, which I'd be a little bit wary of, is this latent autoimmune diabetes in adulthood or LADA type 1.5 diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I just draw the distinction knowing that we have so many smart people, but you know, if you read something and you don't have the context of prevalence perhaps being quite low, you can start to uh, sort of develop an unhealthy uh, association with food and with yourself. Uh, do either one of these hypotheses resonate or you know, if not, I, how else would you account for that? Um, I, I think that there's, we have genetic vulnerabilities uh, and then we have uh, shifts in our microbiome, uh, increased leaky gut, more toxins that increase the vulnerability. I, I don't know, um, but it's certainly a factor that will become a bigger burden for us globally uh, and nationally. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, by addressing uh, self-care, diet, lifestyle, reducing toxin exposure, uh, I think you can greatly improve insulin sensitivity. Uh, and if you're developing prediabetes or, or type 2 diabetes, we've certainly been very successful at helping people reverse that, uh, come off the need for a diabetic medication yeah, uh, and do very well. Sense. But sure. if they go back to the previous diet and lifestyle, it will all come roaring back. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Especially with the hyper palatable nature of a lot of the foods that are problematic. And I can't say I would point to one macronutrient. It's just the fat. It's just the carbs. Oftentimes the crappy food is high in both. They're just calorically dense, nutrient low, and really hyper palatable. It, it, and uh, a few other factors uh, in addition, um, we have a lot of emulsifiers. I was just going to say that. Yeah. A lot that of and, gut and how that can, that uh, that uh, alter the uh, interaction uh, the food has uh, with your mucosa, and it alters the uh, interaction that the um, microbiome microbiota will have with your uh, mucosa as well. Um, so I, I think there are several elements in that fast food that are a problem. So you use it sparingly. Right? Um, I mean, maybe once in a while, but. Um... Yeah, I think we're all on the same page with uh, with avoiding fast food as much as possible. Yeah, you know, coming to all the research that you've done, there's there's probably a few common findings of boy. We see a lot of X, Y, and Z. You already already kind of alluded to that with body composition improving and uh, mm -hmm. energy improving, but. Uh, can you maybe state what some of the most impactful findings you're seeing as people adhere to these changes that you're recommending? Well, you know, what I want to mention is that uh, because, because of my research, uh, uh, we've seen more and more uh, of my early papers being cited uh, in the literature now hundreds of times. Uh, and we now have had 12 dietary intervention studies that have been conducted in the study of multiple sclerosis. Mm. Uh, and in neurology, which is the highest impact journal that has uh, publishes uh, research in the study of MS, uh, January 24th, Dr. Snutzler published what's called a network meta-analysis, mm. which combines all these studies uh, and then looks at uh, their effect on fatigue, their effect on physical uh, quality of life, and on mental quality of life. Uh, and there were eight uh, diets that were looked at. A uh, low-fat diet, uh, the paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, ketogenic diet, calorie-restricted diet, fasting diets, and the usual diet. And what they found was that there were three diets that, that reduced fatigue, the paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, and low-fat diet. And there were two diets that improved quality of life, both the mental health, and physical health quality of life. Uh, and that was 
the paleo diet, and the Mediterranean diet. And then when you look at something called the forest plots, and the forest plots um, are a, um, a lovely image where you have a line uh, that says the, uh, the, the intervention neither favors the intervention nor favors the control. If everything's on the right side that favors the intervention, uh, uh, including the error bars, you know that this intervention is definitely helpful. Uh, if, it's on, if the uh, error bars cross over into favoring control, then it may or may not be helpful. Uh, and it also let us uh, put um, the effectiveness relative to each dietary intervention. Now, now what Dr. Snetzler reported is that, because it's so elegant, because you can see the size of the impact, the paleo diet is the most impactful for fatigue. Uh, followed by the Mediterranean diet, followed by the low-fat diet. For quality of life, the paleo diet is most effective, uh, uh, and the Mediterranean diet is about half as effective, but, yeah, but still effective overall. And then the other thing that was so exciting, uh, Michael, is that they had an editorial written by three other dietary researchers, big names in the field, who said, there is good, now good evidence that diet reduces fatigue, improves quality of life uh, if you're following one of these diets, the paleo or Mediterranean diet. Um, and what's in common is they recommend getting rid of added sugars, processed foods, eating more vegetables, having uh, adequate protein, having healthy fats, uh, nuts and seeds. And then they went on to say, everyone should go see a nutrition professional and should be encouraged to improve their diet honoring their um, culinary preferences, cultural preferences, religious preferences, and what they and their family could embrace. In right. that a paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, these are good diets to use. So I've, I've gone from being wild, crazy, dangerous, to now being heralded as this brilliant, <laughs> innovative researcher. Uh, you know, and I tell my my medical students who come work with me, the postdocs uh, and the PhD students in my lab, that it takes 30 years to change the standard of care. I'm 15 years into that journey. We're, we're just well, halfway yeah. there. Um, Kudos we're that making, you're seeing the needle move, right? That's, we're making some progress. People don't see that needle move until they've, they've passed, so, until, until they've, they've passed, uh, died. Right. So, <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. I have to look up that meta-analysis. I, I think I may have missed that. Um, but certainly, you know, what a seminal paper. Yeah. One of the questions I, I have, um, and I guess let me put my bias on the table first, which is what seems to make the most sense to me is a ancestral diet, which would include mm -hmm. omnivory. Uh, you can really try to cherry pick and find some sort of hunter-gatherer culture that was, well, I, can't, I don't even think I can say plant-based because I don't think any of them no, are truly no. plant-based. Um, so... If, if we can agree on that, and I know you and I do, but I would say just more broadly for someone who maybe prefers a vegetarian diet, fine and okay. My bias comes from looking at our ancestral clues to what we should be doing modern yeah, day. Yeah, six million years worth of data. Right, yeah. We have a lot of anecdote, right? But enough anecdote to be compelling. Yeah, yeah. Within this network meta-analysis, I believe you had said vegetarian diets were included in there. No, 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 um, no, no, I did they not. They were not included. Okay. So, so they had, uh, I'll run the list again. Um, uh, the low-fat diet, uh, in the, in the low-fat oh, low diet fat. study, okay. uh, one included McDougal, which was a, a vegan. The other included a swank diet study, uh, which was uh, from us. Uh, then there's the anti-inflammation diet from Iran. Uh, the paleo diet studies, uh, the, they were all from us. Uh, ketogenic diet studies from another group uh, and us, uh, and uh, fasting studies that were from uh, Kate Fitzgerald's lab. So okay. th there was there was a study of uh, vegan diets. Now, if you're if you're going to be a vegan or a vegetarian, you have to monitor your labs you, to maintain your health. You really need to monitor your labs, and uh, you're, you're going to need some supplements. Sure. Otherwise, you're you're going to your brain's going to get into trouble. Mm. And but but if you that, monitor the labs and supplement, absolutely you can be a vegetarian or a vegan. Yeah, and and you know I think we're similar in that we will support someone in whatever diet they want to use, which is why we created, to my knowledge, the, the only 
vegetarian low FODMAP food list. There was a paper published, I think it was from Monash, about the FODMAP contents of commonly consumed vegetarian foods. So we created a vegetarian low FODMAP diet so that for people at the clinic who were of that persuasion, okay, right, we're going to work with you. But I, I try to, to entertain this diet, the vegetarian diet, its, its pros, its cons, uh, so that people can have sort of a, a global perspective and mm-hmm. make the decision that they're comfortable with. But within that, I suppose, are you noticing any deleterious effects neurologically from longer term vegetarian dieting? I think you kind of answered it. You have to be a little bit more mindful. It can be done. If you do not monitor uh, homocysteine levels, definitely. If you don't monitor uh, uh, minerals, uh, definitely you can. And and so on the homocysteine, is that your proxy for B12 or how are you looking for that? Right, right. So, so, so you look for B12, you can look for methylmalonic acid. Uh, yeah. And maybe on that, on that question, Terry, sorry to keep cutting off your train of thought, but do you prefer MMA methylmalonic acid over a serum B12? Uh, yeah, Mm -hmm. that would be better. And then I, then I also look at, uh, homocysteine. Because you can have a good serum B12, but if your homocysteine is still high, right. there's a problem, and we and we right. have to figure out what the problem is. Right. Okay. Um, another question I was wondering, kind of zooming way out, is: Do you have any concern, or how well are you able to control the healthy user bias in your studies? I'm assuming these people are somewhat proactive. I'm not sure. Maybe you're doing random recruitment and then allocating well, to control. You know, control. We, we certainly. Um, work hard at recruiting. Uh, I do uh, all sorts of podcasts, uh, write blogs uh, to make people more aware of our studies. Uh, and so, I, and the other observation that I have that's true of every dietary intervention study is that people volunteer to be in diet studies because they want to improve their diets. Right. So, always the usual care arm has a healthier diet than the standard American diet. And because in your consent forms, you have to describe the intervention diets and people have, you know, so they, they understand what the elements of the intervention diets are. They could decide like, okay, I'm in the control arm. Well, screw that. I'm going to pick the intervention diet and I'm going to copy it and do it as well as I can. Now, they may not get all of the support from the dietitian. And even um, subconsciously, Terry, right? They they may just have right. that food list in the back of their mind and they're reaching for something the next day at the grocery store and they go, oh, I'm not going to eat that now. I, I'm not going to eat that because I, I think that's probably not good for me. So right. for, for a bunch of reasons, even the usual diet arms always have diets that are uh, much higher quality than the um, standard American diet. So it's quite possible that we'll get to the end of our study and discover that, you know what, the intervention arm, usual diet arm, improves uh, almost as much as the two intervention arms. So we'll have to look at the natural history uh, of uh, brain volume changes that occur in drug studies, uh, that uh, historical drug studies that used um, uh, uh, DMTs versus uh, placebo controls. Um, but you know that is the challenge that occurs in every dietary intervention study because people right. who are willing to do the work of be a, in a diet study have said, you know what, I'm ready to change my diet. Sure. Yep. Yep. Um, with funding, th- this is something I'm partially asking for myself. Um, you know, what does that look like in terms of are these government uh, grants sure, sure. that you're using? So, um, we write grants, um, uh, proposals, and we submit it to the NIH, National Institutes for Health. And to date, I've not been funded by the NIH. I have been funded by uh, private gifts uh, from small foundations, from the National MS Society, uh, and from basically grateful patients. Uh, So, people can still come see me, uh, and we have really transformed the lives of many, many people who then said, you know what, I know you do research. Uh, let me help fund you. Uh, and so we've had uh, some remarkable gifts to do that led us to uh, the first three studies. Uh, the fourth study uh, was funded by the MS Society. Studies five and six were again funded uh, by private philanthropy. Uh, study seven 
was funded by private philanthropy. Study eight, the one that I'm doing right now, uh, was funded by a grateful patient. Uh, it's $2.5 million. Wow. So uh, really huge, huge gift for which we are very, very grateful. Uh, in that will let us do this study, recruiting 156 people and following them for two years, uh, making it one of the largest, longest studies. So if we have listeners who want to help fund uh, me to investigate a new disease state that you care about, we're happy to do so. Uh, and you can reach out to us uh, um, uh, uh, through my website at terrywalls.com uh, and we'll get you in connection with my uh, foundation folks who can help make that happen. And are you, this is uh, admittedly a little bit of a nerdy question, but are, are you using a contract research organization to help you with the implementation? Do you have kind of an in-house staff that sets up everything from the IRB and the compliance? So um, it's all University of Iowa staff. Uh, the, uh, um, we have an Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. They have a division that helps with the IRB applications uh, and uh, the stuff that we might have to do with the FDA. Uh, and all of the IRB stuff. That's so fantastic. yes, that nice. that's why being a university professor yeah. uh, is so helpful because that sure. gives me access to these kinds of staff. Now, mind you, I still have to pay for all those services. So I, I pay my research staff. And then when I use the uh, ICTS staff to help me with the IRB regulations uh, and right. that kind of stuff, I have to pay for those services. Right. But still, I'm assuming, I don't know this to be true for sure, but I'm assuming since the university is carrying a lot of these staff to begin with, you don't have this sort of minimal overhead you have to meet if you're a contract research organization. So the- Yeah, the a contract resort, that, that'd better. be much more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, coming back to the healthcare piece of this, not so much the research, sorry for our audience, you know, n nerding out here, but what are your thoughts on- drug therapies for MS. Do you think there's viability well, there? Are there any that people should be aware of? So um, I'm not opposed to taking disease modifying drug therapy. Uh, I think it's a clinical decision based on the severity of your symptoms. Uh, and do you have disability right now on the number of enhancing lesions that you have, how frequently you're having relapses. Uh, and so the more severe the symptoms are, the more relapses, the more lesions, the more important it is to take a more potent disease-modifying drugs. We do have people who come, uh, and as you look at that, um, you have to weigh, weigh in your own personal risk tolerance. When you read the side effects from the DMTs, mm. depending on the drug, uh, in a side effect, potential adverse things are dying, <laughs> a heart failure, liver damage, kidney damage, life-threatening infections, rare, and then some more frequent kinds of problems. And then if you look at the number of lesions you have, the location of the lesions, the severity of your current symptoms, then you can look at the risk of permanent disability, the risk of becoming wheelchair dependent uh, of job loss. And you have a personal decision, which are you more afraid of? I took drugs that I knew there was a 2% chance of giving me acute leukemia every time I took them because I was more afraid of becoming a financial burden and losing cognitive abilities. Now, eventually, you know, fortunately, I've, I worked it out, so I don't, I don't have to take those drugs, and I'm happy to be off them. It, if you have severe disability, lots of lesions, the, the best decision may be to take high-potency drugs, do diet and lifestyle, and then when you get control, fewer lesions, no enhancing lesions, no fixed disability, then you can transition to a less potent drug uh, with fewer side effects and eventually perhaps to sure. uh, no drug. Sure. Yeah. This is a same conversation we will have when we're caring for an individual with IBD, whether it's Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, indeterminate colitis, and they're saying, you know, do I or should I come off the medications right now? And typically what we advise for them to discuss with their local prescribing is an approach wherein we build them a plan together, get them to a point where they have little or hopefully no symptoms. And that's usually the best time to go through a drug withdrawal therapy or, or, or right. trial. Uh, I think sometimes people have it in their mind, well, but if I'm gonna be doing this diet and lifestyle and nutritional supplement intervention, I want to stop all the drugs. And I get where that's coming from, wanting to separate it out. But 
we want to keep someone's symptoms and their condition as level as possible. So I'd rather them do both simultaneously and then wean off, you know, the the medications. Yeah. I absolutely stress that if you stop your drugs, you're going to have a rebound, a terrible rebound. And we don't know how long you have to have a great effect before coming off the drugs. Is it 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months? We just don't know. So I want at least 12 months of great effect and then a transition plan. My preference is to be closer to 18 to 24 months. But mm-hmm. it, again, it depends on the severity of how bad things were before we got started right. uh, versus uh, uh, someone who was uh, really well controlled. Yeah. And I can't speak to this from an MS perspective, but I can say from a GI perspective, there can be a lot of synergy between the natural interventions and the drug therapy. Again, using the model of IBD, there was a study that looked at a a 12 month or 12 month, excuse me, follow up on those with IBD on mesalazine, this 5ASA class anti inflammatory drug. And half of them were given elemental dieting to supplement about half their calories per day, and the other half just took mesalazine. So they were doing both drugs and elemental dieting in the interventional group, and they cut their risk of relapse in half from 64% to 34%. So, you know, for our audience, I understand idealism and maybe wanting to get off the drugs, but speak with your doctor and and don't rush and get yourself on solid footing first before you try to go through that withdrawal. Absolutely. Because if you if you get a rebound, your your uh, conventional neurologist, GI doc, rheumatologist, dermatologist will say, see, I told you, diet and lifestyle doesn't, <laughs> is not going to work. Yep. So have the long vision. Yep, yep, exactly. And you also might get an escalation of the drug therapy. Oh, you've relapsed. We got to go higher dose or bring in the next, sure. you know, you, maybe you were on five ASAs. Now we need to go to biologics and bring in Humira. So yeah, I think the slow measured approach, the, the tortoise the slow, is really the yeah. way to go here. Absolutely. With some of the immune cells that I know your dietary and lifestyle recommendations can uh, improve, there, there's the microglia, kind of the, the macrophages of the CNS. Oh, yeah. There's the astrocytes, kind of the, the all functional housekeeper, if you will. Um, maybe help people understand how your recommendations help with these two crucial types of brain cells, because there seems to be carryover for general health and wellness yeah, and prevention, yeah. not just for MS. Well, we, we know that uh, the diet and lifestyle intervention uh, really helps calm uh, the inflammation in the gut uh, and calms the innate immune system as we measure it in the peripheral blood. So it lowers the those uh, production of those pro-inflammation molecules, the c- cytokines. Right. Uh, and we also see in animal studies that those same changes lower the inflammation of the innate immune system in the brain. And it calms the microglia activity in the brain. And it calms the astrocytes in the brain. And the microglia and the astrocytes talk to one another. And the other other, uh, fact that that I want to emphasize is that the microglia are the ones that create the opportunity for the myelin to be repaired or to be damaged because it perceives a threat and it's activated the innate immune system. Right. This this is the reason that in animal studies, that diet has a huge impact. I can't do brain biopsies in human studies. It's pretty hard to do uh, spinal fluid taps in human studies. Um, So we're we're going to have to do some indirect measures. Uh, And actually, Again, if we have listeners who would like to donate to my lab, um, we would love to do um, markers, some of those um, markers in the frozen blood that we have. So we could begin to look at surrogate markers of the microglia activity uh, that we have in our frozen blood uh, from our prior studies. And this is maybe just something though, to add in, is that you're taking blood samples and then you're, you're- hubbing some in a freezer so that you can go back oh, yeah. and, and yeah. run it. So this is part of, you know, depending on the level of research that you're looking at, and if it's a longer term intervention that can drive up the cost, but also allow us to have progressively deeper insights. Maybe a new molecule or immune cell is discovered, or you want to run a broader assay. You can go back to that population you can go back to the freezer. and yeah. analyze our blood. 
So we, we keep submitting proposals to uh, analyze our freezer. So we've just submitted uh, a, a big proposal to the MS Society to analyze our freezer, and we'll be uh, submitting proposals to the NIH uh, to do that. That's fantastic. Uh, Terry, what would you want to offer people um, who have MS? You know, any any words for them and also maybe any words for their loved ones? Because I'm sure, kind of like you were describing your, your son and daughter tearing up, uh, this affects the whole family. So what yeah. thoughts or, or closing remarks would you have for people? Um, improve the quality of your diet. You know, if I can come back from being unable to sit up, have, uh, facing really horrific levels of pain, to where I can now jog in the neighborhood. Uh, yeah, I did a 20-minute jog in my treadmill this morning. Uh, really quite lovely. There's hope for you uh, and for the family. Make these changes as a family. See to it that your loved one, when they're eating their meals, that you're all eating the same food. That if you want to eat food that your loved one can't eat, do it away from the home, away from them. Don't come home and talk about it. Uh, do make these changes as a family. Have a conversation. If what you can do as a family is eat the Mediterranean diet, eat the Mediterranean diet. If what you can do as a family is eat the paleo diet, do that. If what you can do as the family is eat the walls diet, do that, but do it as a family. And then sign up, follow me on Instagram. You get to see what I'm eating. Be inspired, I hope. Uh, and if you have MS, if you have relapse remitting MS, please screen and be part of my study. And even if you have progressive MS, please screen so you can be on my patient registry so we can contact you and say, I tell you when we have finally a progressive study that's opened up. Awesome. And can you remind them of the website and anywhere else you want yeah. to point them? Yeah. So please come to terrywalls.com. That's T E R R Y Walls, W A H L S.com. Uh, go to my Instagram at Dr. Terry Walls, that's D-R-T-E-R-R-Y-W-A-H-L-S. Uh, sign up for my newsletter. That way you get to hear uh, the research updates that I provide uh, every week. And your Instagram is great, by the way. You, you really, it's you in the kitchen. You can tell it's not sort of some contrived uh, pageantry. It's really just you doing healthy things, eating healthy food. And I really like that transparency that you have. And also, I'm sure it's very motivating for people. Well, Terry, always, always a pleasure chatting. Thank you so much for coming back on the show.